Welcome everyone to our annual Jewish Community Endowment, uh, Endowment Fund Lecture. My name is Charlotte Elisheva von Robert and I'm the director of the Tauli Center for Jewish Studies as well as a professor of, in the Religious Studies Department and an associate faculty for our Feminist, Gender and Sexuality Studies program, which I mentioned because they're co-sponsors. <clears throat> I'm so pleased to be able to publicly welcome Dr. Gail Riemer to our campus. But before I do so, more extensively, allow me to thank a couple of people who help make this evening's lecture possible. First and foremost, we have to thank the Jewish Federation of the Bay Area and their Jewish Community Endowment Fund, which generously supports our program in Jewish studies to allow us to invite high-profile lecturers once a year. I also would like to thank our co-sponsors, Religious Studies, as well as Stanford's program in Feminist, Gender and Sexuality Studies, as well as Hillel, which as so, of, as so often makes its beautiful space available to us. Uh, Mike Amikana is a representative. I also would like to thank my office staff, Linda Huin, the office manager, and Elena Borowski in the back, along with, uh, with Olivia Johnson, who, um, without whom none of these lectures and events would happen. They do most of, if not all, of the logistical work. Last but certainly not least, I would like to thank Dr. Gail Riemer for her patience. This has been an extremely busy year as I started my directorship in September and this quarter in particular as we are seeking to fill two chairs in my department and have had and are having a number of visiting candidates come on campus that we are hosting. I'm busy with many dinners and extra talks. So things have been a tiny bit hectic for our regular program uh, and there have been learning moments along the way. But allow me to tell you briefly about Dr. Gail Riemer so that you get to hear what she would like to share with our community rather than listening to me. Uh, after doing her undergraduate studies at Sarah Lawrence College and her doctoral work in English and American Literature at Rutgers University, Dr. Riemer she began her professional career as a faculty member at Wellesley College uh, shortly thereafter. In the early 1990s, while serving as Associate Director of the Massachusetts Foundation for the Humanities, Riemer conceived and co-edited two anthologies of Jewish women's writings, Reading Ruth, Women Reclaim a Sacred Story, I have that in my office so can't do the show and tell, and Beginning Anew, A Woman's Companion to the High Holidays, which I have at home on my shelf and meant to bring, uh, my shelf of Jewish books I use regularly and liturgically. Many of us rely on these books to keep our minds busy during long holidays at synagogue, <laughs> whether Shavuot or Rosh Hashanah in Yom Kippur, and read and reread them again. I would like to add on a personal note that I'm happy to know one of the two daughters to whom the woman's companion to the high holidays is dedicated, Ziva, who is sitting there and is a student at Sa in Stanford's Ed School program. And I'm privileged to study with her. Uh, this work on the anthologies with many of the most well-known Jewish women scholars, poets, and writers led Dr. Riemer to the founding of the Jewish Women's Archive in 1995, a national nonprofit devoted to making known the stories, struggles, and achievements of Jewish women in North America and beyond. I encountered it only in the early 2000s when I was invited to contribute to the encyclopedia, then called Jewish Women, a comprehensive encyclopedia now housed at the JWA, uh, I mean the Ru Jewish Women's Archive. Dr. Rima's leadership of the Jewish Women's Archive has been acknowledged with numerous awards, including being named by the Forward in 2001 as one of the 50 most influential Jews of the year and by Women's E-News in 2006 as one of the 21 leaders of the 21st century. Uh, most recently also, she received the Dr. Benjamin Shevach Memorial Award for Distinguished Achievement in Jewish Education and Leadership by Hebrew, by Hebrew College and the American Jewish Distinguished Service Award from Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion in 2012. And there are many more awards. Uh, so we are so honored to host you tonight. 
on a topic that as a German expat is close to my heart. So please help me to welcome Dr. Riemer. Good evening, and thank you very much, Dr. Fomer Bell, for that beautiful um, introduction um, and for hosting me while I'm here at uh, Stanford University, and also to Dr. Kelman for hosting me while I'm here. And special thanks to um, this little thing, Amal, that is somewhere over there, um, who really lured me to California, um, and uh, that's another reason that I'm here, and I hope she behaves. Um, so let me begin. Judaism, as Professor Yosef Yerushalmi has taught us, is a tradition in which remembrance has always occupied a privileged place. As Israel is enjoined to remember some 169 times in the Bible, so it is warned not to forget. Both imperatives, Yerushalmi writes at the start of Zachor, I quote, have resounded with enduring effect among the Jews since biblical times. Had Shakespeare's Hamlet been a Jew, I suspect his famous soliloquy would have begun with, to remember or not to remember? That is the question. This evening, I will be considering this question in relation to a single historical figure, Regina Jonas, who in 1935 became the first woman to be ordained as a rabbi in modern times. While today we may take it for granted that women serve as rabbis, this monumental change in Jewish religious leadership came about only after heated debate and significant controversy. Controversy, I should add, that is still very much alive today in the Orthodox community. Wouldn't we then expect the ordination of the first woman rabbi to be newsworthy, history worthy, and memorable? How then do we explain the fact that Regina Jonas is barely known? The simple answer is that Jonas was a woman, and that until very recently, there has been a very strong tendency for women to be left out when we tell the story of the Jewish past. Our story is told as if all the important historical actors were men, and male activities and accomplishments not just the norm, but the only thing worth recording, preserving, or remembering. That's why a little over 19 years ago, I founded, along with several colleagues, the Jewish Women's Archive to tell a different Jewish story. One that, while remaining thoroughly committed to historical accuracy, would focus on the myriad contributions and accomplishments of Jewish women and pay unprecedented attention to the ways that Jewish women have lived their lives. But while gender bias is unquestionably a factor in why Regina Jonas's story was nearly lost to history and memory, the various phases in the rediscovery of this important figure in Jewish history and the inscription and transmission of her memory make clear that who is remembered and who is not remembered is often a complicated issue. I will begin by filling you in on her life story, highlighting features in that story that might explain why she was all but forgotten for close to half a century. I'll then turn my attention to how Jonas has been remembered and how her story has been told over the last three decades. Finally, I will share with you a short documentary film that I recently completed about a special delegation of some 30 American rabbis, historians, and lay leaders who traveled to Berlin and Terezin this past summer to honor Jonas's memory. So let me begin. Little is known about Jonas's early life, but we do know that it was spent in one of the poorest and most religiously observant sections of Berlin, a neighborhood one historian of German Jewry describes as far removed both physically and mentally from Berlin's middle class Jews. Local records indicate that her family regularly moved from one poor dwelling to another until the death of her father in 1913. Shortly after that, her mother managed to move the family, Regina then aged 12, and her older brother Abraham to a better neighborhood and a small apartment not far from the Orthodox Reichstrasse synagogue. There, Regina attended the Jewish girls' school where she excelled in Jewish history, Bible, and religion. Rabbi Max Vail, the head of school, took a special interest in Regina, tutored her privately, and encouraged her learning. 
So let me pause to comment on a few aspects of, of Regina Jonas's story so far, which may have some bearing on why she was not remembered. First, Unlike most of the women seeking ordination in the early decades of the 20th century, Regina Jonas did not come from a rabbinical or in any other way distinguished or connected family. Her story was to be her story, not part of a larger family story. What name she made for herself would be hers alone and not one to be found in any family or clan records. Second, Though she would eventually train for the rabbinate at the liberal Hochschule, Berlin's higher institute for Jewish studies, her upbringing and her early training were traditional orthodox. She was not a child, not even an adoptee, of the progressive reformers. Her connection to the Hochschule was pragmatic rather than ideological. She wanted to become a rabbi, and no other institution would permit her to pursue that course of study. And as we, we shall see shortly, the institution's connection to her was ambivalent at best. Third, though she lost her father at a young age, Jonas had the good fortune of soon finding a teacher, mentor, and champion in Rabbi Max Vail, a traditionalist committed to the religious education of girls, so a kind of progressive traditionalist. He became her chavruta, studying Talmud and other rabbinic works with her, and a lifelong friend. Unfortunately, Rabbi Vail, one of the rabbis who might well have kept the memory of Jonas and her path-breaking ordination alive, like Jonas, would perish in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's get back to Jonas's story. At the age of 21, after completing her secondary education at the girls' gymnasium and graduating with a license to teach, Jonas began working as a teacher of religion in the Orthodox Jewish school she herself had attended. At the t same time, she began studying at the Hochschule. When I say Hochschule here, I'm, re I'm referring to the Jewish um, Hochschule. As well as training rabbis, the Hochschule certified Judaica teachers and had been admitting women since the mid-1920s. But what distinguished Jonas is that she began her studies at the Hochschule wanting more than religious teacher certification. She wanted to be a rabbi. She took the courses required for ordination and wrote a halakhic thesis titled, Can a Woman Hold Rabbinical Office? under the direction of Talmud professor Edward Bonnet. Bonnet accepted the thesis, which argued that, and I quote, other than prejudice and unfamiliarity, almost nothing opposes a woman holding the rabbinic office halachically, and Bonnet gave it a grade of good. All that stood between Jonas and ordination was for Bonnet to administer the oral rabbinical exam. But when Rabbi Bonnet died unexpectedly, his more conservative successor, Rabbi Hanoch Albeck, would not allow Jonas to take the exam. And Jonas left the Hochschule in 1930 with only a teaching diploma in hand. But Jonas did not abandon her dream. While continuing to teach, study, and occasionally preach, she looked into alternative paths to ordination. In 1935, five years after preparing to sit for the final rabbinical exam at, Ber at Berlin's Hochschule, Jonas traveled to Offenbach to be examined by <coughs> Rabbi Max Dienemann, one of the leaders of German Reform Judaism. Following the exam, Dienemann, acting on behalf of the Liberal Rabbinic Association, presented Jonas with a rabbinic diploma called a Hatarat Hora'ah that stated, and I quote, because I have recognized that her heart is with God in Israel and that she delivers her soul for the goal that she has set for herself and that she is God-fearing and that she has passed the exam I have given her in religious legal topics, I testify that she is capable of answering questions of halakha and that she is suitable to serve as a rabbi." End quote. So I want to again pause to highlight a few aspects of this portion of Regina Yonas's story. First, had Rabbi Banet, the professor who taught Jonas Talmud, directed her halachic thesis and pronounced it good, lived to grant her ordination, he would likely have been invested in the success of his first and the world's first woman ordinee. So too, perhaps, the granting institution, the Hochschule, which having taken this bold step, 
might have wanted to make the most of their progressive leadership in granting women full equality. Instead, she was examined by a relative stranger, Rabbi Dinaman, in a private ordination. Though willing to ordain Jonas, Dinaman would refuse to advocate on her behalf when the Berlin Jewish community would not hire her to lead a congregation. In fact, Dinaman actively discouraged her from applying for any positions in Berlin, whether in the rabbinate or with individual rabbis. It will only provoke protest, he wrote her, because the majority is against you. The rabbi who had responded to Jonas's distress over not being given a congregation with the following, and I quote, though I understand your suffering, I am unable to help you more than I already have, end quote, was not a likely candidate for making her story widely known or for preserving her legacy, nor was he given a chance. Rabbi Dinneman died shortly after emigrating to Palestine in 1939, just four years after he had ordained Regina Yonas. Second, Rabbi Albeck's refusal to ordain Yonas seems to indicate that though the Hochschule allowed Yonas to train as a rabbi, the issue of ordaining women was no more settled at that institution than at other rabbinical schools. The institutional ambivalence would explain why Jonas's ultimate success in securing ordination would not be incorporated into the Hochschule's institutional history, a history that came to an abrupt close in 1942 when the Hochschule was shut down by the Nazis. One year after Jonas was ordained, Rabbi Albeck, that's the rabbi who refused to give her ordination, emigrated to Israel, where he would become a renowned professor of Talmud at the Hebrew University. But as Jonas's ordination held no significance for him, he was not to be the carrier of her memory. Third, between 1930, when Jonas would have sat for the rabbinical exam with, Ra with Professor Bannett, and 1935, when Rabbi Dinnemann examined her, the world of German Jewry had radically changed. Within months of Hitler's appointment as chancellor on January 30th, 1933, the systematic persecution of Jews began. Jewish shops were boycotted, the kosher slaughter of animals was banned, books were burned, and Jews were forced out of their civil service jobs and university and law court positions. The year Jonas was ordained, 1935, saw the passage of the Nuremberg Laws, laws which officially excluded Jews from German citizenship and denied them their basic civil rights. Though from our vantage point, it may be hard to understand, 1930 was still a time of optimism and possibilities in Berlin. Had Jonas been ordained then, her story might have taken a prominent place in the narrative of Jewish Renaissance in Weimar, Germany. But that narrative, as Rabbi Leo Beck would declare, ended in 1933. The narrative of growing trauma and devastation that took its place was hardly fertile soil for the celebration of a groundbreaking moment in Jewish history, the ordination in 1935 of the first woman rabbi. Some have suggested that it was ironically Nazi brutality that made it possible for Jonas to begin functioning as a rabbi. They argue that the intensification of the community's spiritual needs resulting from their growing isolation and oppression, coupled with the emigration of a growing number of clergy, forced the hand of the Berlin Jewish community, which at first had been reluctant to offer her a rabbinic position. Initially hired in 1937 to provide pastoral care at Berlin's welfare institutions, hospitals, old age homes, and the like, as more and more German rabbis emigrated or were deported or incarcerated, Jonas was indeed increasingly called upon to preach, teach, lecture, and officiate at prayer services in Berlin and other Ger German cities as well. Friends urged Jonas to leave Germany, but she, like her teacher and colleague Rabbi Leo Beck, felt duty bound to stay and minister to the frightened, demoralized, and suffering Jews who did not have the means to leave Germany. In November 1942, Jonas was deported to Theresienstadt, the designated concentration camp for prominent German, Austrian, and Czech Jews. 
By the time Jonas arrived in the Nazis' model concentration camp, in addition to the regular deportations from there to death camps like Auschwitz, the death rate within Theresienstadt had gotten so high that the Nazis built a crematorium capable of handling almost 200 bodies a day. Viktor Frankl, the famous Viennese psychoanalyst who after the war wrote Men in Search of Meaning, recruited Jonas for his suicide intervention team, a group that received new transports and helped the newly arrived deportees overcome their shock and grief. Frankel would later remember Jonas as one of the team's more influential and important members. She was very gifted, Frankel told his biography. She was his biographer. She was an excellent preacher also, he added. Notes for one of the sermons Jonas preached in Theresienstadt would eventually be found in the Terezin archives, along with a document listing 24 lectures on biblical, Talmudic, and religious themes. The title at the top of the document reads, Lectures by the One and Only Female Rabbi, Regina Jonas. According to Dr. Margalit Schlein, director of Beit Terezin, the Terezin Memorial Museum and Archive in Israel, these lectures were part of an extensive program of lectures and study groups on history and Jewish philosophy, which were set into motion under the guidance of Leo Beck, Benjamin Mermelstein, a figure some of you may be familiar with from Claude Lanzmann's recent film, The Last of the Unjust, and Regina Jonas. For close to two years, Jonas ministered to her fellow inmates at Theresienstadt in whatever way she could. Then on October 12, 1944, she and her 68-year-old mother were deported to Auschwitz, where it is, it is assumed that they were gassed shortly after arriving. In this last chapter of Jonas's life, there is much about which we can speculate. Had the Nazis not risen to power, would the Berlin community have gradually accepted her and allowed her to fully function as a rabbi? Or would they have more aggressively prevented her from preaching? Had there been no Shoah, would other women at the Hochschule or elsewhere have looked to her as an example and followed in her footsteps? Might women's impact upon the rabbinate have become, begun four decades earlier than it did? And what if Jonas had emigrated after Kristallnacht like so many of her colleagues? Would her smicha have been accepted in America or England? Would she have been embraced as a first or ridiculed as an imposter? What if Jonas had survived the war along with her colleague Rabbi Leo Beck? Would he have continued to acknowledge her as a colleague and support her efforts to serve as a rabbi? Or would he have felt constrained to not make waves? Had Leo Beck talked or written about his experience in Theresienstadt, would he have made known his work with the one and only woman rabbi? And if he had, would his recollections of her have had any impact on whether and how Regina Jonas was remembered? Which brings me to the heart of this evening's inquiry, to remember or not to remember. A perfect moment to again invoke Professor Yerushalmi. In his book, Zachor, he suggests that there are three aspects to remembering. First, the active transmission by a generation who possesses the past to the present generation. Second, the acceptance by the present generation of what it has received as meaningful. And third, the commitment of the present generation to passing on what it has received. A people forgets, Yerushalmi wrote, and here I am quoting, when the generation that now possesses the past does not convey it to the next, or when the latter rejects what it receives and does not pass it on. Forgetting occurs, he elaborated, when human groups fail, purposely or passively, out of rebellion, indifference, or indolence, or as the result of some disruptive historical catastrophe, to transmit what they know of the past to their posterity." End quote. We know today that a great deal of forgetting occurred as a result of the most disruptive historical catastrophe in Jewish history. Among the forgotten, at least for some time after the Shoah, was Regina Jonas, the world's first ordained woman rabbi. What's not clear, however, 
is whether Jonas was forgotten because those who knew her and survived failed for whatever reason to transmit what they knew, or because those to whom knowledge of Regina Jonas was transmitted failed purposely or passively to accept it as meaningful. A look at the history of the recovery of the memory of Regina Jonas suggests that the processes of remembering and forgetting took different paths in Germany and it's really Germany and Europe and in America. The critical turning point in the recovery of Jonas's memory was the fall of the Berlin Wall and the opening of the state archives in the former East Germany to researchers from around the world. Among the researchers who began mining the newly accessible archives was Dr. Katharina von Kellenbach, a German-American professor at St. Mary's College of Maryland. Kellenbach was looking for materials that would help her understand the attitude of the religious establishment, both Protestant and Jewish, to women seeking ordination in 1930s Germany. And she was looking specifically for information about the Jewish woman who, according to a rumor she'd heard, had been ordained in Germany. The envelope she eventually found contained Regina Jonas's ordination certificate, photographs of Jonas wearing a rabbinical robe, a copy of Jonas's thesis, newspaper articles by Jonas, as well as about her, her ordination and her activities as a rabbi, and letters from her teachers at the Hochschule, from other rabbis, and from ordinary people whose lives she had touched. Kellenbach's resulting article on the life and thought of Rabbi Regina Jonas appeared in German feminist magazine in 1992. Two years later, a second essay, this one in English, was published in the Leo Beck Institute yearbook. The fall of the wall and of communism also sparked a wide-ranging Jewish renewal movement in many European countries. Alyssa Klapchek and Lara Deming, two of the founders of Beit Deborah, a Berlin-based European Jewish feminist initiative, described the phenomenon in an essay they wrote for the Jewish Women's Encyclopedia, the same encyclopedia that Dr. von Rebert mentioned earlier. Liberal, and I'm quoting um, what they wrote, liberal Jewish groups and egalitarian prayer groups arose in almost all the larger cities in Germany, some initiated by private individuals, some as new liberal congregations. All of them criticized the emptiness of the prevailing spiritual religious life and sought for possibilities of an appropriate renewal which would relate to the earlier tradition of liberal Judaism in Germany, for so long con to considered to be a thing of the past. Equality of the sexes constituted a common spiritual denominator for all of them. Equality of the sexes, by the way, was a topic that Regina Jonas wrote a lot about. A central issue for German Jewish feminists like Klapchek and Deming was whether they were simply trailing behind American Jewish feminists or did they have a spiritual heritage of their own to build upon? The question they posed to themselves, and I quote, was what can Jewish women latch onto half a century after the Holocaust? Jewish women there meaning German Jewish women. In his book, History, Remembered, Recovered, Invented, Professor Bernard Lewis notes two of the main reasons that individuals as well as communities remember the past. One is to justify a disputed present, and a second, he writes, is to predict and even to control the future. Eager to predict a vital future for Jewish women in Germany and Europe, Klapchek, Deming, and their colleagues determinedly latched on to the forgotten Regina Jonas. Kellenbach's archival discovery provided them with the story they needed. In Regina Jonas, they saw a woman whose feminist thinking and commitment to reviving Judaism gave their own aspirations and those of their colleagues in the German Jewish feminist movement a set of origins and a history. Moreover, as Elisa Klapchek would write in her biography of Regina Jonas, published in 1999, Rescuing, and I'm quoting Klapchak, rescuing Regina Jonas from oblivion opened new doors. If Jonas and those who supported her could see new horizons back then, wrote Klapchak, why should I not have the same possibilities today, she asked. 
A look at the reception and transmission of knowledge about Rugina Jonas in America tells a markedly different story. In the same years that Katharina van Kellenbach discovered and began to write about Jonas, the reform movement in the United States was celebrating the 20th anniversary of the ordination of Rabbi Sally Prezant, the first woman to be ordained as a rabbi in America and the first woman ever to be ordained by a rabbinical seminary. These two qualifiers about Prezant's ordination in America and by a rabbinical seminary had over the years been used regularly by historians and others who had some vague awareness of Regina Jonas and found reason or occasion to take that into consideration when talking about Rabbi Prezant. Yet when it came time to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Prezant's ordination, the organizers of a special academic conference at the Hebrew Union College saw no reason to use qualifiers and simply subtitled the conference Honoring 20 Years of Women in the Rabbinate, 1972 to 1992. The publication several years later of the papers delivered at the conference carried the same subtitle, even though one of those papers, Ellen Umansky's presentation on women's journey towards rabbinic ordination, recounted the story of Regina Jonas and her ordination in 1935 which placed women's entry into the rabbinate 40 years earlier. Now, for those celebrating Rabbi Prezant and 20 years of women in the rabbinate, Regina Jonas should not have been news. Prezant herself had written about Jonas two decades earlier in her thesis turned book titled Judaism and the New Woman. She introduced the brief section on Jonas with the sentence, I was not truly the first woman rabbi. And she concluded that section with, I was actually the second woman rabbi then, though I was the first to be ordained by a theological seminary. In the early 70s, some broad outline of Jonas's story had been transmitted to Prezant by one of her professors at HUC, who prior to emigrating to America had known and taught Regina Jonas at Berlin's Hochschule. And Prezant made a point of passing that memory on in her book. But recalling Yerushalmi's understanding of remembering and forgetting, we might ask whether Prezant in 1972 fully accepted Regina Jonas' story as meaningful, as having any relevance to her or her American female colleagues seeking ordination. And if not, how effective could her passing on of the memory have been? Even as she acknowledged Jonas, Prezant's language betrayed a certain ambivalence about the knowledge she was passing on. I was not truly the first, though I was the first. And in the preface to her book, Prezant's reluctance to allow Jonas's story to disrupt the narrative of her as the first woman ordinee is even more pronounced. And now I'm going to quote a bit from the preface. On July 3rd, 1972, she wrote, I was ordained rabbi by HUCJIR in Cincinnati, Ohio. As I sat in the historic Plum Street Temple waiting to accept the ancient rite of smicha, I couldn't help but reflect on the implications of what was about to happen. For thousands of years, women in Judaism had been second-class citizens. With my ordination, all that was going to change. One more barrier was about to be broken. When I entered HUCJIR, she continued, I did not think very much about being a pioneer. I knew only that I wanted to be a rabbi. With the support of my parents, I was ready to spend eight years of my life studying for a profession that no woman had yet entered. Now, Prezan was indeed a very significant pioneer. And I would even say that among her pioneering acts was being the first to tell the story, what little was known of it at the time, of Regina Jonas. And yet, at the same time, she unintentionally undercut the meaning of that story, the ordination of the first woman rabbi in 1935 Germany, in ways that might explain why few who read her book would recall that they had ever heard of Regina Jonas. Why, for example, Rabbi Laura Geller, third woman to be um, ordained at HUC, actually the third woman to be ordained as a rabbi in America, recent, recently recalled that in all her years as a rabbinical student at HUCJIR, and that was from 1971 to 1976, not once did she hear Jonas's name. It would have been helpful to me, she said, 
the only woman in my class to have known her, to have known her story. In other words, she didn't know the story. It would have been helpful to her had she known the story is what she was saying. Why Rabbi Amy Eilberg, the first woman to be ordained in the conservative movement, in a historic forum in Berlin this past summer, turned to Rabbi Prezan and said, and I'm quoting, I read your book, Sally, so I must have known about Regina Jonas at the time in the 70s, and yet somehow, because she was a figure in the shadows of our knowledge, I didn't carry the story with me. Rabbi Prezand, of course, was writing about Jonas two decades before the discovery of Jonas's papers. This past summer, she would recall that the professors who told her about a woman who had been ordained a rabbi in Germany in the 30s didn't say much about Jonas. And, quote, there was nothing really to read about her. I feel somewhat guilty, Prezan continued, and I'm quoting, that I didn't do more research myself, but I was so involved and focused on trying to become a rabbi that it was just a piece of information I kept in my head, end quote. Prezan was talking about the 70s. But even after the publication of Kellen Buck's articles on Jonas in the 90s, the ambivalence evident in Prezan's book continued to shape how Americans received and transmitted Jonas's story. Take, for example, the most important scholarly work related to women and the rabbinate to date, Dr. Pamela Nadell's Women Who Would Be Rabbis, A History of Women's Ordination, 1889 to 1985, published in 1998. Nadell tells the story of the woman Jonas, who became a rabbi, but then quickly assimilates that story into the broader story of women who wanted to become rabbis but did not succeed. She concludes the chapter in which she writes about Jonas looking ahead to the 1950s and 60s and the next generation of women who would set the course toward the rabbinate. As they did, Nadell writes, and now I'm quoting, they unknowingly followed the road already paved by Martha Newmark, Irma Lindheim, Dora Askowith, Helen Leventhal, and Regina Jonas the women who would have been rabbis. With Jonas subtly moved into the same sentence in space as the women who sought ordination but for different reasons never became rabbis, Nadell protects the narrative of Sally Prezand as the first woman to become a rabbi and America as the obvious environment in which this significant religious innovation would occur. This pattern of acknowledging but Jonas but keeping her in the shadows is also evident in Deborah Goncher Binnick's 2006 Emmy Award winning documentary titled And the Gates Opened, Women in the Rabbinate. In the film, Regina Jonas is sandwiched in among Ray Frank, the charismatic preacher who never formally studied for the rabbinate, what was dubbed the Girl Rabbi of the West, Henrietta Zoltz, who pursued studies in the rabbinical school at Jewish Theological Seminary, but not ordination, and Paula Ackerman, the Rebbitson who took over her husband's Meridian Mississippi pulpit after he died. Here again, Jonas's importance as the first woman to be ordained as a rabbi is buried among the stories of not quite rabbis. Dr. Carla Goldman, another American historian who has written about women in the rabbinate, picked up on the figure in the shadows image as she recently reflected on why, in spite of knowing about Jonas, she had not seen her as part of the woman rabbi stories. For me, Goldman wrote, I quote, Jonas seemed a shadowy figure from a time and place far removed from the social progress we associate with the ordination of women rabbis. The essence of Jonas's story was obscured by that hard to comprehend period of Jewish life under the Nazis, so definitively defined for us by hatred, death, and extermination. Her reality was much removed from us by both time and tragic circumstance. How could we understand her? What could she have to do with us? To this day, for most Americans, Germany is a place of Jewish catastrophe, decidedly not a place to which they would look to claim a legacy. Till very recently, neither they nor the Jewish organizations that represent them wanted anything to do with Germany and could only see Germany and German history, including German Jewish history, from a Holocaust perspective. So it is both not surprising that there was a certain reluctance Amer uh, among Americans to make the German Jonas a part of their story of women in the rabbinate, and that when they took a significant symbolic step in remembering Regina Jonas, the memorial they erected 
was on the site of the former Theresienstadt concentration camp in the columbarium, the room where the ashes of the dead are stored. When the European Beit Deborah women memorialized Regina Jonas, they placed a plaque in front of Regina Jonas's former residence in Berlin. When Americans decided to memorialize Jonas, they dedicated a plaque in the concentration camp in which Jonas was interred before being transported to Auschwitz and murdered. The plaque, of course, acknowledges that Jonas was the first woman rabbi, and it notes the extraordinary spiritual strength with which she continued to preach uplifting sermons and provide pastoral care to her fellow prisoners at Theresienstadt. But the placement of the plaque emphasizes Jonas as a victim of Nazi persecution rather than as the first woman to break the barrier and enter a profession no woman before her had entered. The plaque in Berlin was dedicated in 2001. The plaque at the Terezin Memorial this past summer, thanks to the efforts of Dr. Gary Zola, executive director of the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives. Dr. Zola, also a presidential appointee to the US Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad, proposed to the commission whose primary purpose is to identify, mark, and preserve Jewish cultural heritage sites in Central and Eastern Europe that it honor Rabbi Jonas's memory with a special plaque at the Terezin Memorial. A little bit more history about that trip, which I could tell you about, but I see that um, the clock is ticking. So what I would like to do is um, uh, just introduce the film, um, which is about this trip that I was just talking about. It was a powerful trip for all of us, um, rabbis, scholars, and lay leaders and ended up with a call for a regular annual remembrance of Jonas to be observed by all denominations. I'd like to screen it for you. Um, and it, I just recently co completed it. It's, it's first public screening. Um, and then I'll conclude with a few preliminary <coughs> thoughts on why in the summer of 2014, almost 80 years after Regina Jonas's ordination, her story was finally fully embraced by this group of Americans <coughs> as part of their story the story of Jewish women who became rabbis and ever since have been transforming Judaism and Jewish life in America and abroad. Thank you. So if, I'm just going to try to complicate the film a little bit for a few minutes and then get into a conversation. Is that OK? Yeah. OK. So um, for me, actually, for many of the people, and um, you saw one of them speak about it, one of the most, is this on? Or just should I yell? Um, one of the most uh, poignant <coughs> moments of the trip was when the participants, the rabbis in particular, were shown Regina Jonas's papers at the Centrum Judaicum's archive. There was a similar moment in Terezin when the group crowded around the documents from the Terezin archive, announcing and listing the 24 talks to be given by the one and only Rab Rabbi Regina Jonas. Unfortunately, our camera person was busy setting up for the dedication ceremony, so we didn't have any footage of the second encounter with Jonas's documents. What I saw at those moments, not insignificantly as I was approaching my own retirement from the Jewish Women's Archive, was a deep and urgent curiosity arising from what I would call the anxiety of retirement. I could not help but notice, as I'm sure you did, that most of the rabbis on the trip were at a point in their lives where retirement was on their minds. When Rabbi Prezant, a cancer survivor who first retired in 2006, exclaims, this is it, her whole life in a box? It seems obvious to me that she's thinking about her own legacy. What will be preserved? What will be remembered? By whom and why? Reflecting on the encounter with Jonas's paper, Rabbi Prezan, who on the 40th anniversary of her ordination had given her own papers to the American Jewish Archives, said, I quote, it made me understand how important it is for all of us to save everything and give it to the American Jewish Archives so that we can have our stories told and hopefully, hopefully, be role models for the next generation. The uncertain, end quote, the uncertainty about how they, the first generation of American women rabbis, would be remembered by future generations was echoed by Rabbi Laura Geller in an article she wrote for Tablet Magazine after the trip. And I quote, 
Many in the, last, in the latest generation of women rabbis don't think of themselves as feminists. For them, being a rabbi is a birthright. They grew up with women rabbis. They have little sense of what it took to get to this point. For those of us in the first generation, that is a bit frustrating. During the trip, Rabbi Geller also spoke about her impending retirement. And I'm quoting her again. I'm coming towards the end of my career as a congregational rabbi. Retirement is in the foreseeable future, although exactly when I'm not sure. And I'm beginning to think about my legacy and what it is that my having been a rabbi has meant, not only to the small circle of people with whom I have interacted, but on a larger scale. And so the idea that there was this woman named Regina Yonas and that she has a legacy and that we didn't know about it suddenly becomes really interesting and important to me. The anxiety of, end quote, the anxiety of retirement is really an anxiety about becoming invisible, about being forgotten, or about not being remembered as one hopes to be remembered. Recall Rabbi Geller's comments in the film on Yonas's thoughtful foresight in organizing her papers. She chose these papers. She was creating how she wanted to be remembered. As this first generation of American women rabbis retires or anticipates retirement, they have begun to reflect on how they will be remembered. And as they did so this summer, one sensed what Professor Yerushalmi described as a sudden sympathetic vibration, a sense of empathy, of recognition, and opened their hearts more fully to remembering and preserving the memory of their foremother, Regina Yonas. With the publication of Katrina von Kellenbach's essay on Jonas in 1994 and Alyssa Klapchek's biography in 1999, Regina Jonas's place in history was assured. With this summer's trip, the culminating commem commemoration at Terezin, and the participants' subsequent commitment to press for a cross-denominational annual commemoration of Jonas on the Sabbath closest to what we believe would have been her yurtzeit, the work of assuring Regina Yonas's place in Jew Jewish communal memory has begun. Thank you. So I'd love to hear, is that, is that what we do? Yeah. Good. Um, I invite everyone to, um, and it's a mic. there's a mic that goes around. I'm, I'm just wondering, um, how did you manage to get all of those women, and particularly those rabbis? Was it easy to get them all to agree to come on this trip? Or oh, so that was the part of the talk I cut out. So uh, now I can. Uh, okay. So um, just the very quick summary of that. Thank you, Shani, for asking that question. Um, the very quick summary is um, I, I started by telling you that Rabbi Zola of the American Jewish Archives uh, suggested to the United States Commission um, that they uh, um, place a plaque at Terezin. And then he contacted Rabbi Sally Prezant and said, would she join him at Terezin for the dedication of a plaque? Now, Rabbi Prezan, um, for the last few years, has actually been speaking with the other um, three first women rabbis, first American women rabbis, um, on numerous occasions. And she said to Dr. Zola, um, why don't we bring all four rabbis? Um, and um, he liked that idea, but he knew that would cost money. So he contacted me and said, why doesn't Jewish Women's Archive co-sponsor this with us? <laughs> Which meant help raise money for it. I, in turn, suggested to him that um, this is going to be a very, um, I mean, to have those four rabbis on the trip play in Terezin, this should be a bigger trip and we should involve many more people in it. Um, it wasn't done as systematically as it should have been done in terms of who came and who didn't come. Um, but uh, the really wonderful part of the trip was also that once we got to um, Europe, we were joined by the first rabbi from um, Poland, the first rabbi from England, the first rabbi from um, uh, Czechoslovakia, and uh, first, first woman rabbi, I'm sorry. First woman rabbi, thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi, Patty. Hi. I'm very conscious. I'm not quite in that very, very first tier, but shortly after that, 
Uh, when we were in rabbinic school and in the process of thinking about who went before us, we often quoted this Monique Whitting quote, which I just looked up on my iPhone. There was a time when you were not a slave. Remember that. You walked alone full of laughter. You bathed bare-bellied. You say you have lost all recollection of it. Remember. You say there are no words to describe this time. You say it does not exist. But remember. Make an effort to remember. Or failing that, invent. <laughs> I think that we understood that we needed to invent because we didn't know that there was something to remember. So when, when you talk about Sally having known on some level but not having known, there was a male rabbi who had kind of a vague outline that didn't turn it into the invention that she could then carry on into the next generation. So I think the fact that you in some way put flesh on her bones made it tangible and real that we don't have to invent everything that happened in the past, that some things we actually can remember is a really important gift for those of us who are among the first women rabbis. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very, for all of that. And it's a, I, it's a wonderful um, quotation from Winnie Quiddig. And um, I, I would just add to that, I, the people who put flesh and bones on Regina Jonas were really um, Katarina von Kellenbach and then um, Alyssa Klapczyk, who wrote the biography. And um, just this past summer, a Hungarian um, uh, filmmaker Diana Gru did a, fi a full film on Regina Jonas. So um, there are people who are really putting flesh on her. Yes. So uh, I was in the entering class in the Jewish Renewal Movement to become a rabbi. I wasn't the first to be ordained. I want to point out that Rabbi Eliza Klopek is a renewal rabbi. And we also have a first, I'm sorry that she wasn't included in the trip, but Kolaka vote for bringing together all the others. Um, I want to point out that often Jewish renewal in the Olive Ordination Program is still considered private ordination, even though it really isn't. And I want to applaud you for bringing out that point about Regina Jonas, because I think that that issue of privacy of ordination is relevant. And to that I want to add that I've had the privilege of knowing Rabbi Ted Alexander, who's now just 90, and his father was one of the rabbis who provided ordination for Regina Jonas. There were two others. I can't remember the name of the other one at this moment. And in addition to that, um, Rabbi Leo Beck, four days after Rabbi Dinneman ordained Regina, uh, Rabbi Leo Beck provided a letter of Mazel Tov, which was considered a very big deal because he was the uh, president of the Algeminer, which was the rabbinic association that included both the liberal rabbis and the orthodox rabbis. And just, I think it was in February of, two, of 1942, he actually provided her with a certificate, um, which acknowledged her ordination as a rabbi. And that was, I think, very shortly before she was interred in Therese. Yeah, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, what, uh, you know, what Leo, Rabbi Leo Beck's relationship to Regina Yanas was and what those letters meant. And as you could see, we were really puzzling over it when we were sitting there with the archivist and what exactly was the letter that he wrote. You're quite right that he, he did write her a letter of congratulations that's in the archive. Um, by the way, it's phenomenal that she saved this archive, you know, that she had the forethought to put her papers together um, because we'd have no story if not for that. Um, uh, it takes someone to write the story afterwards, but you, you need the documents as a starting point. Um, but. Uh, but the, the actual um, certificate that he gave her was, n it's not clear what it was. It, it didn't certify that she was a rabbi. What it certifies is that um, she is uh, good enough to preach. At least the, um, that, the research that I've done and the research, you know, the people that we talked to this summer, that, that's where we came out in terms of what Leo Beck had actually done. It was, it was a very complicated, uh, thing that he needs to do to keep the Jewish community satisfied and at the same time to recognize Regina Jonas. And he was, as the archivist says, or I guess it's Gisa Aderberg who says that, is, he, was, he was really trying to play both sides, it seems. I mean, that's 
you want to say something about no, that? No, can I just add a footnote? Eliza, who is a good friend of mine, she did not go on the trip she, because she got married, she got not married, because right. she was excluded, right. just to make that clear. <laughs> so no, she got married that way. Mar that Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb was the first, ordained right. in 1980, and she wasn't included in that. Yeah. I mean, and also we have the first woman rabbi in Scandinavia, uh, Rabbi uh, Lynn Feinberg, also uh, is the first in Europe, and she's renewal. Right. Now, in terms of the participants on the trip, I wouldn't say that it was, you know, the, um, it was, it was an ideal trip, but it wasn't the ideal perfect grouping. Okay. Um, I have a question for you, which is how many of you knew about Regina Yonas before this evening? No. Oh, okay. So I guess that's the point of why <laughs> we, we're doing this. Yes. Um, I'm fascinated by the, the very disturbing contradictions. I mean, progressive thinking and enlightenment and liberty. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm fascinated by the the uh, the, the, the contradictions in the in the history. I mean, it's very disturbing the uh, progressive nature of ordination and the enlightenment, but then the restrictions and um, it just kind of seems to illustrate that Aufklärung is not Aufklärung. You know, enlightenment is not Al enlightenment necessarily. And I wonder if you could perhaps comment on that a little bit. Well, I think, you know, any progressive movement is going to take small steps or take steps along the way. A, a revolution never, it's, we use the word revolution to assume that it all happens at once, but it doesn't happen at once. Yeah. There are small steps that need to be taken. Um, I think, you know, another issue around the, or you know, why Regina Jonas was forgotten is that there is a sense that whereas in America there really were small steps, some of the women that I mentioned that Pamela Nadell writes about in her book, women who really tried to break into um, the rabbinate but for various reasons weren't able to, there was there was a lot of picking at that door, whereas in Germany, Regina, it seems that Regina Jonas was the first one to actually try to become a rabbi. Nobody else had tested those waters before, as far as we know. Um, so uh, not everybody is going to embrace her immediately. They, they, the whole idea was they weren't used to it, even though she had been in the school already for four years by the time she was supposed to be ordained. I think even here, and Pamela Nadell tells the story about, now we're talking about um, earlier years, earlier part of the 20th century, um, the women who um, sought, who, the women who would be rabbis but never um, became rabbis, um, people often just assumed they'll drop out. So they would put up with their being in the school, um, figuring it wouldn't make a difference. And there's some people who have speculated that was true of the Hochschule as well, that um, everybody assumed Regina Jonas would leave or be satisfied with a teaching certificate. Well, and you know, when Abraham Joshua Heschel brought the first woman into Jewish Theological Seminary, they said to him, um, Rabbi Heschel, we will never ordain women. And he said, we will bring them in, someone else will ordain them. <laughs> That's good. That's a good story. That's great. Um, thanks. This was good. I have two short questions. Um, one is, uh, has her dissertation been translated into English? And has it been like republished? In yes, it's in Alyssa Klapek's book. Um, uh, the second part of the book is the translated thesis. And my second question is, um, what was the decision behind putting the plaque at Terezin and not like on the former side of the Hochschule? Well, the point, I, at least the way I understand it, is Americans are still very tied to the Holocaust. That is a story that is compelling for them, um, a story that uh, is, is part of their memory system. And so incorporating her into that memory system uh, made more sense for them than doing it in Berlin. I still think there's a resistance to Berlin and Germany. I mean, that's my reading of this. I don't know, um, I, I don't, you know, Dr. Zola might say something different, um, but I think there was an immediate attraction to a Holocaust site as opposed to a German site. 
Does that make sense to you? It does. I just think it's wrong. Okay. <laughs> I think you're right. But I think the rationale is off. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about you know, the American Jewish Committee opened its office in Berlin in 1998. So this is very recent that Jews are willing to even be in Berlin. I mean, American Jews are willing to be in Berlin. It's, it's very, and we're not that far from that period. I think there's been a lot of change recently. Um, and uh, the young man, Mike, who was doing the audiovisual stuff was telling mm -hmm. me he was just in Germany on one of these exchanges where they're bringing um, young American Jews um, with, in the hope of changing that mentality, but I think that is part of the mentality that you see here. It's less conflictual to mourn a victim than to mourn a pioneer or honor a pioneer. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, I was going to add, I think it also has to do with um, we are tied to the story of the Holocaust as an end, as an end of European Judaism, and especially of German, uh, German Judaism, and we need that because America, Ameri and the American Jewish community conceives itself so much as we have the new beginning, and so to undo that narrative is going to be, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, I, I know that's a generalization, but to undo that narrative is going to be very, very difficult. And the moment you turn the woman into a first, then right, that change that undermines that entire that right. entire narrative because then you have the, the beginning There's of the continent, right? Yeah. So, but any of you? Um, so this is partly inspired by just being stared down by that uh, portrait, which is of course done in a in those super classic um, kind of like antibody all on the face yeah. mode of scholastic portraiture. Um, I guess I was wondering. I mean, I, I was struck by the fact that all the quotes taken from her dissertation um, were about how, in fact, like the soul is not gendered or not sex; that there isn't fundamentally a difference, and we shouldn't pay attention to it. Um, so I guess going along with the theme of remembering, do you think that she would have been wanted, that she would have wanted to be remembered primarily as a woman, or if that in some sense kind of goes against the strain of her thought? Um, and relatedly, if there's anything in the materials that indicates that she thinks she brought something specific to, the, to her rabbinical role as a woman. Those are great questions. Um, let me answer the first. Um, in most of the writing where she writes about men and women, she really she talks about the need to transcend that. That um, we'll know it's not a problem when we're not talking about it. Um, so I would guess that she would prefer not would have preferred not to be thought of as a woman rabbi um, in in that sense that you're asking. And the second question was. You actually answered them both in one. Oh, I did? Yeah. Okay. The second one was about what was in her papers. Okay. Um, another thing, though, that she, that I didn't talk about, but I think is um, important, and here she's, she really was in the same, um, in those years, was thinking in the same way, say, as Rabbi Leo Beck and Viktor Frankl. Um, she really, uh, she saw as her most important role to give people hope and a reason to think about a future, people meaning Germans, who were steadily losing any reason to hope. But she saw it as her obligation and her duty to do that. So a lot of her writing is about having hope and belief and faith. Maybe one more question. Um, I was just wondering, as someone who grew up in Jewish day school, if there's any effort um, happening to try to get um, Regina's story, you know, to educate kids with these stories, specifically Jewish ones. Well, um, as I said, uh, one of the things that these rabbis um, uh, on the trip uh, have dedicated themselves to is to have an annual remembrance day. Um, you know, and I'm sure it will be of Regina Yonas, and then will enlarge into women rabbis. Or, um, but it's going to start out as a day um, of remembrance for Regina Yonas. And in fact, they they tried to institute it very quickly when they got home from the trip. And I'm amazed when I went to, um, you know, when I Googled Regina Jonas, how many times, um, how many congregations um, actually republished Laura Geller's piece in Tablet. 
So there, there's so many entries of um, just from 2014, from after the summer of 2014 on Regina Jonas. So the trip already had some kind of impact. I think with, with this film, um, our intention at the Jewish Women's Archive is to create educational materials that will go with the film, and those will clearly um, be for um, schools as well as for adults. So thank you, and if you have not seen or gone to the website of the Jewish Women's Archive, you absolutely have to. This is one of the most important resources and forms of public memory also. So I highly encourage you, and I really thank am you. very grateful that we got to see this, the movie. It was really, really moving, so thank you again. Thank you. So thank you.